Welcome to worship. We're really glad that you're joining us from wherever you may be today. Before we get started, we just wanted to, to take a moment and let you know about a, a change to our worship schedule. Starting June 6th, we will be adjusting our times for worship, thanks in part to the, uh, the survey that you may have filled out regarding the, the recent uh, lifting and changing of COVID restrictions. So starting on June 6th, we will be worshiping inside in the sanctuary at 9 a.m. We'll continue to worship online at 9.30, and then we'll also be outside on the green at 10 a.m., weather permitting. We hope that if you've been watching with us online and you feel comfortable joining us in person that you would wanna do that, but we just hope that one of those options uh, meets you wherever you are and that you can continue to worship with us here at Aldersgate. So let's get started today. Let's worship our Lord.
In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 41 to 44, Jesus and the disciples are in the temple. At least they're on the temple grounds. Worship in the temple was actually outdoors. And as Jesus and the disciples watched just opposite the treasury, they watched as rich people came and gave lavish gifts to God and deposited those in the treasury. But then there came a poor widow woman that the scripture says had just two small copper coins. And those two coins equaled together about one penny. And she placed her two copper coins, her one penny, in the treasury as her gift to God. And Jesus says to the disciples that this poor woman has given more than all the rest because those rich persons gave out of the excess of their wealth, whereas she gave everything she had, even that little bit she needed to live on, she gave it all to God. The scripture is clear that the Lord knows what we give to God, but he also knows what we keep for ourselves. Let's present ourselves and our gifts to the Lord. Heavenly Father, receive, we pray, the gift of our very selves. And these are tokens of our love and devotion to you. Receive them as well, we pray that others may come to know the Christ we love and serve. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Show me. 
We turn today on this Pentecost Sunday to the book of Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 21 and I'm reading from the New International Version. This is the story of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the church, what we often refer to as the birthday of the church. When the day of Pentecost came, They, the disciples, were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. 
fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, give us ears to hear what the Spirit would speak to each of us this day. For we pray it in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. 20 years ago, when my father passed away, I inherited his library. My dad was an eclectic reader, a little bit of this and that from anywhere and everywhere. And I set myself a task, and that task was to read all my dad's books. And 20 years later, I am just now finishing that project. One of the uh, books that I left till last uh, was a huge book by James Mishner called Covenant, which is the historical record of the development of South Africa. My college roommate married a gal from South Africa and ended up moving there and raising his family there. I've gotten to know other South Africans over the years, and so I was very interested by Mishner's history of the land of South Africa. There is one particular story that he tells in that book that dates back to the Boer War in South Africa at the beginning of the 20th century, roughly 1899 to about 1902. There was an English general by the name of Buller, who promised that he would lift the siege or defeat those who were laying siege to the South African community of Lady Smith, and that he would do it in five days. He continued to make that same promise for at least three months. I will deliver Lady Smith in five days. Over and over and over again, he made that same promise until it was meaningless. When he finally did get around to trying to lift the siege of Ladysmith, it didn't take five days, but rather 19 times that long. It took a total of 95 days to lift the siege of Ladysmith. And General Bueller's promise was regarded by the people of South Africa as worthless. Now, juxtaposition that worthless promise next to a promise that was made by Confederate General Robert E. Lee. He once famously promised a businessman that he would do something in particular for him after the war. And that businessman doubted Robert E. Lee's promise. And so he asked one of Lee's aides, what guarantee do I have that General Lee will actually keep his promise? The aide replied, you have the general's promise. You could not ask for a better 
guarantee. Today is Pentecost Sunday in the Church of Jesus Christ. It's the day we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit on those who are followers of Jesus Christ. And it is the fulfillment that a, of a promise that Jesus Christ, our Savior, made on Ascension Day, 40 days after Easter. Pentecost is the 50th day after Easter. And so this fulfillment of God's promise on Pentecost of the coming of the Holy Spirit made through Jesus Christ, his son, is a promise that is utterly reliable. There is in the Greek New Testament a word in Greek that we translate as power. That Greek word is dunamis, from which we get our word dynamite, dunamis, dynamite. When uh, I was pastoring in Carlisle, we were celebrating a special anniversary. I think it was 175 years for that congregation. And one of the things that we did in order to celebrate that anniversary was to pull together all the oldest members of the congregation and interview them as a group on videotape. One of the most interesting stories that came out of that exercise was the story about how Wagner's United Methodist Church got its stained glass windows. The story took place back in the 1930s before electricity came all the way out to where the church sat in the country. The church up until that point was lit with coal oil lamps. And the church elders decided that they were going to do away with the coal oil lamps and replace it with a carbide gas system. When you introduce a carbide gas system, it requires a tank of water be buried in the ground and little pellets drop and are released on a regular interval. And those pellets, when they hit the water in the tank, create the gas that runs the lighting system. Wagner's church is located about four miles outside of Carlisle on the north side of town. And that's only important because of the kind of ground that's there. Any farmer in that area will tell you that they farm slate ground. The ground is uh, uh, only has a few inches of topsoil and that topsoil sits right on slate, very hard ground to dig. And so when they went to install the tank for the carbide lights, the elders of the congregation decided to use a half stick of dynamite to loosen up the slate to dig the hole to put the carbide tank inside. They lit the fuse, ran around to the front of the church and stood on the little stoop that was the front entrance of the church. But they underestimated the amount of power that they were unleashing when they lit that half stick of dynamite because it blew out every window in the church. And that's how Wagner's church got their stained glass windows at the same time that they got carbide lights. Sometimes as believers, we underestimate the power of God's Holy Spirit dwelling within us. In Zechariah the prophet, chapter 4, verse 6, we read these words. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Here in this American culture, we are taught to be self-reliant to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We even have a proverb in our culture that says, 
God helps those who help themselves. Now, folks, I hope you understand that that's not a biblical quotation. In fact, the Bible makes very clear that if we're believers in Jesus Christ, there are certain things that we cannot do for ourselves. That's why Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, so that we might enjoy the salvation that he alone can give us. We also understand that we cannot serve Jesus Christ. We cannot be in ministry in our own strength and power, but rather, as Zechariah says, by my spirit, says the Lord. The purpose that Jesus promised that Holy Spirit to the early church was made quite clear. He says, and you will be my witnesses because you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. Some years ago, Marty and I were volunteering in a ministry uh, for homeless folk, and it's called Family Promise. Our particular responsibility for the evening was to play with homeless children. And we found a, a, a bunch of toys that somebody had donated, and I grabbed this one toy because I'd never seen anything like it before, and I didn't know exactly what it was. It had a pull string to it, and when I grabbed hold of the toy and pulled that string for the very first time, up arose something that looked like a frisbee going round and round and round and just took flight. And it was marvelous and the kids had a great time with it. Uh, I didn't realize what that pull string was for but it was to provide the power for propulsion for that toy. And it all worked fine until the pastor ended up putting the one half of that toy up on the church roof. We have a power at work within us, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit. On Pentecost Sunday, God poured out his Holy Spirit on every believer. Those tongues of fire came down and rested on every one of those believers. There was the sound of a mighty wind. There was these tongues of fire and suddenly everyone began to speak the praises of God in different languages. Jerusalem had been filled with visitors because they were there for one of the great Jewish festivals from all over the world and they heard this noise and it drew them together and suddenly everyone present hears God being praised in their own language. The exact opposite of the Tower of Babel occurs. God's praises are being spoken in every language and understood. Some people who witnessed this event made fun of it and thought it meant that these people were drunk at nine o'clock in the morning. But the Apostle Peter stood up and said, no, this is a fulfillment of what God promised through the Old Testament book of Joel, that in the latter days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your young men shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And both on male and female will my Holy Spirit be poured out. The purpose of God's power being poured out on his people was to empower them for ministry and for witness. The Apostle Peter stood up and gave witness to all who were gathered there that day that the Holy Spirit had been poured out. And when he was done preaching, the Holy Spirit added to the church that day over 3,000 people who responded to Peter's preaching not because of his strength or power, but because of the Holy Spirit at work through him. When I was a pastor at Camp Hill United Methodist, 
we worked through a season of discerning where God was calling us in mission and in ministry. And we determined that our mission field was threefold. Number one was Camp Hill. Number two, Harrisburg. And number three, West Africa. We're told in today's scripture that Jesus said that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, the city, Judea, the county, Samaria, the next place north from there, and to the very ends of the earth. Concentric circles that get larger and larger. The Holy Spirit is poured out on God's people to empower us to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, first close to home, and then further and further and further afield. Howard Hughes, the eccentric multi-millionaire who lived out his last days in Las Vegas, at one point read something somewhere about drip and dry clothing. And he went out and he purchased a drip and dry shirt. He took it into his bathroom in his hotel room in Las Vegas and put it in the sink and got it sopping wet. And then he hung it up in his shower. 45 minutes later, he checked that shirt and found that it was dry, crisp, and ready to wear. He was so impressed that the product lived up to its tagline, to its promise, that he went out and bought the country, the company. This morning, God's promise to us is this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. General Buller's promise was absolutely worthless. But the promise of Jesus Christ to all who believe of his Holy Spirit to empower us for mission and ministry is utterly dependable. Howard Hughes was so impressed by the quality of one, prom one product's promise that he went out and bought the com company. Do you believe the promise of Jesus Christ to you that you too will be empowered by the Holy Spirit as his ambassador, as his witness, as his minister? And if you do believe the promise of Jesus Christ, how will you embrace that promise today? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that indwells every believer and empowers us to do the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ. Use us, we pray, as ambassadors in this generation to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those on our doorstep and those that are further afield. Lord, use me. Use us. Use each and every disciple here at Aldersgate Church, we pray, for the glory of God. We ask this in our Lord's precious name. Amen and amen. But I know here in the 
the middle is the place where you promise to benediction this morning I'd like to share the words of the Apostle Paul from 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 13 the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all Amen